Good afternoon, Shockers. I'm Courtney Marshall. I'm the president and CEO of the Wichita State University Alumni Association. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Homecoming 2020. Obviously, we're coming to you virtually, but we are doing a lot of things this year, just trying to stay safe in this time of coronavirus. So we're glad you're here to join us. And it's my pleasure to welcome the Dean and as well as several faculty, faculty members from the Fairmount College of Art, Liberal Arts and Sciences. So wanted to give you a brief bio of Dean Hippus Lee. And his background is in Russian language and literature where his BA with honors and MA from the University of London. Um, his PhD is in computational linguistics from the University of Surrey where he taught in the Department of Computing. And he moved to the University of Kentucky in 2007, where he served as inaugural chair of the Department of Linguistics and the University Senate President. He has published extensively in linguistics, where he has five books and multiple articles. He, is made, he was made a fellow of Linguistics Society of America in 2018. Hippisley was selected as an American Council on Education Fellow in 2016, the nation's marquee leadership program for rising academic administrators. And in July of 2018, he began serving as the Dean of Wichita State's Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, where he oversees some 20 departments and schools. He is a strong advocate of the power of liberal arts and sciences education and believes passionately in creating opportunity for all for lifelong learning. One of his goals is to expand experiential learning for liberal arts students through internships, undergraduate research, and study abroad. We're thrilled to have him here today, as well as several faculty members that he'll be introducing. I'll turn it over to you, Dean Hippisley. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you very much for that introduction. Well, uh, I am the 20th Dean of the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, so we have a little bit of history. I'd like to get through some of that history in a second. Um, we have currently 200 faculty, but we weren't always like that. And as Courtney said, we have some 20 departments. So let me give you a whistle-stop tour from 1895 to 1926, the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. A lot of people don't know this, but the original plan was for a women's college. So we had a religious interest in this, the Congregationalists, they were interested in promoting education in, plans, in Kansas by creating a young women's college. They wanted to call it something like the Wichita Ladies College or the Congregational Female College. It was to be the Vassar of the West. So in 1887, the trustees named it Fairmount Ladies College. Next. So it, the idea was to admit women 12 years old and older. Uh, they cited Fairmount Hall, main campus building, uh, but after the building boom collapsed in 1888, that building stood open. So what happened next? Next. So um, in, in September 1892, a long time ago, Fairmount Institute for Men and Women opened in Fairmount Hall. It was a preparatory school. And then on September the 11th, 1895, over 125 years ago, classes began for 30 Fairmount College students, and it was funded by the Congregational Educational Society. That institute continued to operate within the Fairmount College until 1918. Next. So here's a picture in 1895, and there's some very interesting people in this picture. I don't know if you can guess who they are, but let me go through some interesting people. So we have Clifford Clark. With He brought his bicycle to work that day. He was the person who brought golf to Wichita. Who else do we have? We have Professor Roulette, who was a friend of Nathan Morrison. And where is Nathan Mar Morrison? There he is, right in the middle of the picture. And then we have Henry Isley. I'm the 20th Dean. Henry Isley was the first Dean of the Fairmount College. Next. Here we have two very different men. Next, on the left, we have Morrison, the idealist, calm temperament. 
He was a preacher and a professor. He had to be a fundraiser. If Elizabeth King is watching this, it goes right back to Morrison. He was fundraising and he was rather ascetic as well. Grapes and water was his diet. He came as a slightly older person at 67. And then contrast that with, uh, yes, he, one thing about him, he hated fundraising. And presidents and deans love fundraising now, but he hated it. Uh, he persuaded the faculty, I think, um, not to get paid at the beginning. And he himself, a lot of the time, didn't want his own pay just to keep the thing going. Constantly out fundraising. Contrast that with Isley. Practical man, aggressive temperament. I don't know if that's the ingredients of being a dean of Fairmont College, but there he is. And he took care of the day-to-day -day business. Harvard educated. And of course, he had a lot of personnel issues to, do, to deal with, like any other deal any other dean. So this is a letter he wrote to Morrison. I wish to report to you some facts concerning a difficulty between Professor Sickner and Mrs. Marager. They have not been getting on very well with each other for many days. She broke her umbrella over Sickner's head. Seems to me that it would be very unwise for us members of the faculty to become involved in this trouble. So you can see he was a very wise man too. So in those days, back in 1895, there were four faculty, which increased to 14 by 1899. Those are the salaries. They went from 500 to double, $1,000. First graduating class was eight. And the 1899 class motto was a posse at essay, from possibility to realization. And they thought of themselves as, as modeled after New England residential colleges. There's a nice picture of Fairmount Hall, uh, which of course is no longer exists, it burnt down. And people had fun in those days. Uh, here's late 1890s, the women of the college, because the women were there from the very, very beginning, having some fun in some Kansas weather. And this is the colors haven't changed too much. We have a, a black and a kind of uh, sunflower gold as the colors. And this was a vote by students. Here's the early curriculum. So remember this modeling after the New England Residential College. You had to do English, Greek and Latin, uh, French and German, no mention of Spanish, music, uh, chemistry and physics. Look how physics was there from the very, very beginning. Uh, bookkeeping and very interesting, psychology was there at the beginning too. And of course you had to go to chapel every day. Here's Flora Colby Clough. She was the Dean of Women's. Here it says, pictured as a stern and thin-lipped Dean of Women who was capable of keeping the girls within the bounds of her rigid regulations. From her, students learned that chewing gum in public was poor taste, Chewing gum in class was forbidden. And there's the football team from, nine, from 1905. And the first game, the first pass was on Christmas Day, 1905, where Fairmount was playing against Washburn and it was a good natured tie. And if you look at this, this is a very similar period of time. The women's athletics too, the women's basketball team. And if you look carefully, you will see they have an F on them, F for Fairmount. Well, two tragic things happened in 1907. The first president died and within a few months, the first dean died. At his memorial service, it was said these two profound scholars teachers of marked excellence in the classroom and workers with inexhaustible energy. And you will see, if you go to Maple Grove Cere Cere uh, Cemetery now, you will see a plaque that says that these two are the legacy of their effort is Wichita State University. You can see that in the next slide. And I will say right now to, co to commemorate 125 years, Fairmount College has organized a scavenger hunt where we have the students walk around the graveyards, 
finding facts about Morrissey, Isley, and other famous people from this college. Curriculum slightly to change in the 1900s, sciences and modern languages were gaining a significant place. And now you had to choose, you didn't have to do Greek and Latin, you could do Greek, Latin, or French, or German, or even Italian. And you had to do chemistry. And after 1912, you chose from either physics, botany, or zoology. Majors were had to be 35 hours, a minor 15, that hasn't changed much. And here are some women working. And if you look very carefully, you will see that they are reading books. So the 1924 curriculum, this is getting close to the end of Fairmount College, general education. So you had to take these areas, English composition, art, Bible, government, economics, physical education, foreign language, psychology, which is still there, and either mathematics or science. You needed 64 hours to graduate in your freshman year and sophomore year and 64 in your junior, 128 hours to graduate, not much different to now. And there's a nice picture on May Day, 1924. Well, 1920s, it was never a very financial stable place in those days. And the fourth president, Fairmont College, was very worried about the financial future. So he had some choices to make. Do we move it somewhere else to attract a better crowd? Do we close it down or do we make it public? And the choice was to make it public. So in 1926, the decision was made to transfer ownership of Fairmount College, which is a private entity to the city of Wichita and Fairmount College then was renamed the University of Wichita. But Fairmount College lives in the history and Fairmount College is very much alive within the universe of Wichita State University. So that's the, that's the past. Let's, let's bring us up to date from 1926 to 2020, where we have now the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences within Wichita State University. Now, what was missing from that curriculum way back in the 1890s and 1920s was the field of criminal justice. And you might think, well, that's because that's a really, really modern field. And maybe it had to wait for 100 years to come into life. But that's actually not quite true. And I would love to introduce you to our uh, director of the School of Criminal Justice, Dr. Andy Bannister. And Andy, I'd love to ask you, first of all, tell us a little bit about what criminal justice is and how did we come across criminal justice at Wichita State University? What's that story and what are some of the exciting things that criminal justice is doing right now? Because this is not Greek or Latin, is it? No. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about the criminal justice department at WSU. It's steeped in um, a rich history tradition. It was established in 1935, and it's actually the second oldest in the entire nation. It was established with the assistance of O.W. Wilson, who is a premier um, progressive in law enforcement and believed in the professional model of law enforcement. Um, he was he encompassed the stronghold not only of on-the-job training, but also the idea of education and the relationship, the nexus between education and officers on the street. So very, very progressive in his time. In fact, he was very actually instrumental in establishing the program here at WSU, um, introducing six police science courses of, into the curriculum of the college, along with police training school here. Fast forward to today, because this is what we, what we have here now. What we have here now, I'm actually sitting at right now, is um, I'm on the third floor of the Law Enforcement Training Center on the Innovation Campus. It's reminiscent actually of days past, all cadets for both the Wichita Police Department and Cedric County Sheriff's Office are trained here in this building. So cadets, so new officers, also a, as well, we do in-service training for law enforcement officers. We'll have officers come from outside the, the agency, outside this jurisdiction, sometimes from out of state coming for training here, specifically in this building. Um, the School of Criminal Justice actually is comprised of more than just criminal justice. We also have forensic science, we have Homeland Security, we have ROTC, 
And we have, of course, criminal justice. Um, we're housed on the third floor, actually, of the building, and the a law enforcement training center building. Although the school's actively actually been involved in law enforcement training and technical assistance for many, many years, um, the reality is the fact that we are now in close proximity with law enforcement because they're in, in our building, um, it's heightened this relationship between us and the law enforcement community. We're currently working on a number of federal grants um, with the Wichita Police Department, the focus of which pertains to and targets violent crime that we've seen an uptick in, in Wichita lately. Um, and also the relationship go, with law enforcement goes beyond just the grant work that we're doing right now. In fact, we have a number of law enforcement officers that actually take our classes to either start their degree in criminal justice or forensic science or homeland security um, they, to complete it, or sometimes they're actually working on their master's degrees here in our program. We actually also have officers that teach in the program ad, as adjuncts and some pretty popular courses that a lot of students even outside of the criminal school of criminal justice like to take. We have courses on um, BTK, we have courses on serial murder, homicide investigation, gangs, human trafficking, stuff like that that's very attractive to, to many students across campus. Also, we see a number of our graduates actually, when they complete their degree, they go ahead and join the police department. So we see them not just, you know, it's not once they graduate, they're gone. We see quite a few of them actually now become law enforcement officers and also many go to, on to law school. And lastly, another component of the school that's flourished um, through grant work and close proximity to law enforcement networking and other external projects we work on is that we have the opportunity to place our students in um, co-ops and internships, not just locally, but also around the state. It gives our students a foot in the door and oftentimes an edge when seeking employment. Um, it's more common that our students end up, that our students actually that have done the internships and co-ops end up finding a permanent spot in the, in the agency that they did the co-op or internship in. And these opportunities are available to all of our students, regardless of the program that they're under, whether it's criminal justice, forensic science, homeland security. Like I said, we also have um, ROTC here in our, under the umbrella of the school. So actually we're, we're quite busy. We have a lot going on. Um, we're very proud of our students. We're very proud of the working relationship that we have with law enforcement, corrections, courts, law schools, um, the, front, the field of forensic science, the field of homeland security, et cetera. So it's, it's been really outstanding to actually move on to the innovation campus and have such close proximity with the law enforcement community out here. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andy. And it is unusual for a liberal arts and sciences college to have a school of criminal justice. And I once asked them, do you want to be, do you want to stay in our college? And they said, <laughs> oh yes, we love it for this college. So that was the right answer. But one thing that Andy kept on mentioning was this engagement with the local community. And that's something that this college is very, very uh, passionate about. I we should add that we also have the School of Social Work. We have the Hugo Wall School of Public Affairs. And we have a psychology clinic, all doing the same kind of work, reaching out to the community and showing the community that Wichita State, Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences is of value to them and their lives. Thank you, Andy. That's a great story. I'd like to introduce you to uh, someone from another realm uh, in the social sciences. Uh, we have a very strong department of anthropology uh, and uh, Don Blakesley is kind of the star. Uh, he's done some amazing things and I want to just to bring him on just to talk a little bit about anthropology, uh, some of the work that he's been doing and also talk about how anthropology is an old field which requires brand new shiny tools. So Don, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I love that introduction. Uh, anthropology overlaps just about every other academic discipline in one way or another. Uh, we study social systems, but we also are involved in the humanities and fine arts. And definitely in archeology, span we use the hard sciences as a, and the scientific method in order to understand those. And so we end up using various kinds of high-tech equipment. Archaeology also connects modern populations with the past, either their own, if they're native in this area, if they're Native American, or with the local past. And so 
We have been working on a site called Etsanoa down in Ark City, which is the second largest archaeological site in the country. And it has generated all sorts of opportunity for our students and others. So except for this year, because of COVID, we offer a month long field school in archaeology where students get hands on training in the basics of the field work. This also draws students from other universities and offers an opportunity for us to do some recruitment. It also provides lab work and again, the opportunity to gain skills. Our department has an endowment which allows us to offer part time work for two students each to work with Dr. Dozier, the other archaeologist and myself. And in Arc City, we co we cooperate with Cowley College with the Etsanoa Conservancy, the local school system, the economic development officer, and city officials. And among other things, this has led to a two plus two agreement with Cowley College so that their students can transfer seamlessly into our anthropology program. The people in our Kansas City see Etsanoa as a prime uh, opportunity for economic growth down there. And the local conservancy is currently planning a major fundraising event to start this year in order to build a visitor center. Even prior to that, uh, we've gained international reputation and next summer they will have their first tour of the internet, totally international tour of people coming from France. So to work with them, Dr. Cebu of our department is creating a cultural anthropology field school to be held annually down there. And he's working with the mayor on that. We're also cooperating with other departments, including CJ, uh, criminal justice. Uh, David Clam trains his students and ours in the use of 3D scanners by bringing them down to our excavation. And two years ago, we had the only two undergraduate anthropology students in the country who knew how to do the post-processing for the 3D imaging. Uh, one of them is now in a graduate program and the other is gainfully employed doing field work in archaeology. Currently, we're also working with Ted Adler from the Ceramics Department of Fine Arts and uh, one of our undergraduate students to replicate the pottery that was made at the site. And those replicas will be used in turn by other students to do experiments in various kinds of food processing under Dr. Dozier's direction. And we're talking with him and we have yet to involve geology, but we want to in a short course to teach the basics of ceramics uh, to students from all of the departments. There are opportunities as well for cooperation with other departments with geology. We're very interested in their ability to do thin sections with biology. I've already, you're gonna meet Doug, Greg Hausman in a bit. He and I have already had a chat about the ecological aspects of at Sanawa with computer science with electrical engineering, with the museum studies program, with history, with instructional development over in the College of Education, with entrepreneurship in the business school. Uh, even music has a place. Uh, it, one of the little things I'm <laughs> very proud of, maybe not so little, is that our site at Sanoa is the only one in the, the country that has its own symphony. Uh, that was funded by the local uh, public school system down there. So we have the opportunity with this site alone for very long-term research, very integrated that brings in not only the people in Ark City, but the Wichita tribe as well. And there's the opportunity in the long run, once I'm gone, to expand that out, Etsanoa was one town in the place that the Spaniards called Quivira. And Quivira was roughly the size, or actually slightly larger than the size of the Republic of Ireland. And there are other towns in 
Cowley County, Butler County, Rice County, McPherson County, Barron County, Elk County, and many campsites beyond that. So the opportunity to draw in other local museums, other towns, and to have a, a tourist attraction that will have a worldwide impact. So we're busy and we hope to continue to be that way. Thank you. Thank you, Don, for that. And I'm, I'm just struck by how outward you are in your narrative there. There you are sitting there in your office with all these books, but in fact, all that heavy research led to all sorts of current collaborations, both research collaborations as well as community collaborations, and the future is like this. Um, and it, it's, Don really represents a lot of our faculty in the college, uh, serious researchers who also know that they can't do it alone. alone. They need the computer scientists, they even need people in music, as Don said. Uh, so a great story, and I think you're going to hear a lot more about Ed Sanoa as the years go on. Um, I'd like to now turn to uh, another discipline, another area. Uh, we haven't really mentioned the sciences at this point. Um, when, if you remember that early curriculum, uh, physics was mentioned and chemistry was mentioned, uh, there was no mention of biology, which is odd. So, um, and in fact, right now, we do not have a department of biology, which seems odd too. We do though have a department of biological sciences. And I'm going to ask Greg Hausman to come and tell us a little bit about that department. He's faculty in there. Uh, tell us a little bit about the disciplines that can be represented in such a department. And also tell us a little bit about his exciting uh, research, which leads him to being outdoors an awful lot. So over to you, Greg. Well, yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, so it, it is interesting to look at that history and see that biology doesn't make quite the uh, uh, appearance you might expect uh, early on in the Fairmont College, but it certainly has uh, gained a lot of momentum, especially over the last, uh, say, I'd say two decades. It's uh, more than double if you look at the undergraduate and, and graduate enrollment in our in our department and you know we we do a number of different kinds of things it's a very broad department and that's kind of what andrew's getting at with the De department of biological sciences we have one whole broad focus on cellular and molecular biology where we have people doing research on cancer biology uh doing neurology doing doing uh, genetics work with some uh, types of female reproductive challenges. Um, and all those things are uh, really grounded and really depend on understanding these cellular and molecular processes and have important ramifications for uh, human health <clears throat> and uh, really important training grounds for, for students who are looking to go on to med school, and dental school, etc. The other part that goes along with a general department of biological sciences is field biology so that would be things studying plants birds insects etc and uh, that's a part of our department that has grown remarkably over the last 15 years so we're studying well for one thing you know when you do field biology you it, it really makes a difference where you're located um, certainly, you can go do studies in the rainforest, but it's expensive and challenging logistically. Um, it turns out that Wichita is in a great spot to be studying prairies, and that's what a lot of our field biology is about right now, is studying prairies. You know, it, we're in one of the better regions for, for uh, uh, studying them because the Flint Hills, which many people know about, um, is located in Kansas. You know, you drive from Wichita to Emporia, you're going to drive through the Flint Hills and you notice there's this topographical variation and some very um, unbroken grassland. And that is uh, not only unbroken grassland, it's the largest intact tall grass prairie in North America, that strip in the Flint Hills. It turns out that WSU is just, you know, about 40 minutes away from being in the heart of that. And recently we uh, have gotten uh, a, a large area that we have access to is that's become part of our field station. 
So in order to do a lot of field biology, it's great to have a field station. We do have one that's been uh, uh, kind of our key site at Niniska. Um, and so just to back up a step, the, the Niniska part of our field station uh, was started by Don Disler. A lot of people know about Don Disler because he was uh, a very charismatic uh, uh, re researcher and, and teacher of biology, of field biology. And he started that field station um, and uh, focusing on how to restore prairies and studying all the organisms that are out there. And so that's continued to be a key part of our uh, department and, uh, and our field biology for training students. And then now we've added this large uh, tract of land out in the Flint Hills. It's uh, almost 5,000 acres in size. So it's a massive area and very picturesque and providing tremendous opportunity to study uh, insects, birds, uh, plants, et cetera, uh, get our students out for uh, field trips, for classes, for doing fundamental research, also on the aquatic resources that are located there. Um, you know, one of the problems with doing things virtually like this is you can't see it very well. You have to go out there. Um, and so, you know, when I took Andrew out there, it's, it's a whole different experience than trying to look at a picture of it or even showing it online. And so, uh, it, yeah, again, probably the best thing I can say is think about that drive between Wichita and Emporia for understanding what, what that kind of looks like. Um, so we are uh, uh, having a, a good deal of success right now with getting uh, external grants where we're studying these grasslands. We're also studying uh, some of the CRP, Conservation Reserve Program prairies across the entire state of Kansas. Uh, trying to understand how to manage those better for these are private properties primarily, but how to manage those better. Again, both for wildlife, but also for uh, landowners and the potential role of cattle on these landscapes. Um, and so all these things are providing neat opportunities, both for our faculty in terms of how we bring that in, in terms of teaching, but also providing opportunities for undergraduate research. Um, we both in the lab and in the field, um, we're, we're being quite creative about how to get our students involved with those things because in order to do science, biological science, you really have to do, to do it well is to do it with research, is to understand how research works, what it takes, what are the challenges, what do you have to overcome, what can you say and what you can't say with the data that you have. All those things are pivotal in terms of training. And then the other things I think we're really starting to do is have an impact beyond just, uh, uh, you know, sort of cell bi biology. We're, we're having an impact more on, as I described it, some of these uh, rural landscapes, both from how to manage land better. And, um, you know, our, our goal is to try to help people recognize that there are other uh, institutions besides K-State that are doing some important uh, research when it comes to these uh, natural landscapes. So uh, I, I think the future is bright. We're, we've uh, put up a couple of buildings. Almost all um, or much of it was funded by grants or other sources of revenue, not from any student funds. We're continuing to, to make that a priority and in, in to provide opportunities for students and faculty um, without in increasing any of the burden on them. Thank you, Greg. And I'm just struck by a couple of things there. First of all, you are, your very strong emphasis and I think enthusiasm about undergraduate research. Uh, you uh, are clearly a, an extremely serious researcher yourself and uh, this is very fulfilling to you, uh, but you don't want it to stop there. And a lot of people would think, well, that's fine. That's what graduate students are for. But you didn't no. say that. You said undergraduates. So yeah. Uh, so so let me give you, I can give you one example of that. So I have a freshman who just started a couple months ago and she's already become integrated in my lab. Um, and she will probably start her own independent research, um, not just coming in and washing dishes or doing any of that. She, she will be the one who is helping to guide the ideas, collect the data, analyze the data. That's going to be part of her almost from day one um, uh, in terms of opportunities that we can offer to students. And Greg's not alone in that. We have many of our scientists and others who uh, really enjoy bringing undergraduate undergraduates in. Now this, I have not heard about a freshman coming in. I love this idea of 
<laughs> getting them as freshmen, I think we need to do a lot more of that. Um, but we have faculty who really enjoy doing this. Another thing that Greg said, and it, and, and, and it goes back to what Andy and Don said, is that his research and his team is having uh, impact on a particular community entity. These are the ranchers or the landowners. And I think something that you'll find with this home of yours, Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, is we don't operate in an ivory tower. We're, our research spills over and has an impact, and that's what we want to happen. And Andy mentioned that with Chris, criminal justice and law enforcement. Don Blakesley has mentioned that. He's, he's basically, his research has excited an entire uh, city and, and will have huge effects economically. Well, um, biology, uh, it's a wonderful thing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a traditional field. Uh, I want to now uh, turn to our last faculty of the day to talk about maybe what I would call the, the, the future, part of the future of Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Uh, Nick Solomy is a NASA scientist. Um, he's also a serious researcher who loves working with undergraduate students, and some of those students are the best I've ever seen. Uh, and he has this wonderful idea of um, educating students in the field of space exploration. So Nick, if you are there, tell us what is space exploration and why would Wichita in particular care? Well, thank you, Dean Hipsley. Uh, as uh, the Dean said, I'm uh, Dr. Nick Salome, professor of physics here at Wichita State University. I've arrived here in 2007 to be the 17th chairman of physics here at the uh, University College uh, with the first one being Dave Ayers back in the 1880s. Um, so we did a few changes when I came here. And one of the changes was that uh, instead of having lots of individual uh, professors doing their research by themselves, we started implementing hires where professors would work together. I work with a group of people both in particle physics and I also work with a group of people now across colleges, including uh, aerospace engineering uh, with NASA in regards to space science. So we have a, a wonderful, um, both of those actually are very complementary in one way or another, because one group in particle physics, we do a, we get a lot of our students to get exposure to um, Fermilab in Chicago where accelerator physics is done. And another, the other half with the space science effort with the NASA grant, we work with Marshall Space Flight Center in, and we incorporate aerospace engineering faculty, uh, electrical engineering faculty, as well as uh, two faculty in physics. And this uh, space science is actually in a lot of ways a new revolutionary idea. In the original days, right after NASA was founded, there were like seven universities created that, that would give a degree in space science. These were all very close to NASA facilities like Marshall Space Flight Center in the University of Huntsville, Alabama, or Caltech next to JPL. And as the private space industry is growing, this private space industry uh, has a need for much more people who are educated in the ability to uh, operate and get equipment into space. Now, you know, so a study in space science is not astronomy, it's not astrophysics, it's not engineering, and it's not physics. It's a field unto itself where professionals, yes, they need a knowledge of engineering, their specialty. They need a knowledge of a natural science like biology or physics, but they also need to know all the special conditions that are, are required to operate and put equipment into space. And so that's the specialized field of space science. And this space science is a, is a rough environment. Imagine the first, uh, you're the person putting the first piece of equipment into space. Uh, a lot of that equipment was very short-lived because it shorted out. It wasn't designed to operate in these huge plasma voltages of space. It wasn't designed to survive the huge radiation intensity in the radiation belts that we didn't know about until we actually started launching rockets into the radiation belts. And so there's a lot of special knowledge that electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, aerospace engineer, physicists, or biologists needs to know when they're putting people or equipment into space. And this is a growing field in the sense that the Department of Commerce has estimated that this field alone would get uh, 8,000 new hires 
um, people that you know don't exist right now per 10 years. And so that's, that's a huge demand that the, the universities that are currently teaching space uh, science aren't actually able to fill. Uh, the, uh, the most recent space science department that was created was the University of Colorado uh, School of Mines in Golden, uh, Colorado. And as soon as they created that uh, degree program, they immediately had 72 students per year graduating from the program. Uh, so it, it's a very high demand program. Uh, it gets uh, good jobs. It brings industry to the local uh, region, uh, industry of the space. Uh, industry and it's a growing field the private space sector it's not just SpaceX there's over like 500 new companies now that didn't exist at the time that we were landing people on the moon solely to, to cooperate with putting equipment into space. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, physics, aerospace engineering, they all, all have the ability to help. Uh, but in physics, particularly, we've grown since I first arrived here in two 2007. We currently have uh, nine professors. Uh, we're doing um, uh, a bachelor's of science and bachelor's of arts in physics. We're doing a master's in physics, and we have a. Uh, and we're in a, now in the department of mathematics, statistics, and physics. We're we offer a joint degree. Okay, Nick, you um, just towards the end there, we lost a little bit of you, but we got most of what you were saying. And um, one of the things that uh, strikes me about what you're saying is you are, uh, you love your research on the one hand, but you are very aware of the economic and labor context in which the physics department finds itself um, and this space sciences program has been researched in the context of the demand for certain kinds of jobs and i think this is very important for everybody to know about fairmont college of liberal arts and sciences that we are not again we're not in an ivory tower we're not we don't isolate ourselves we are very aware of the changing workforce and changing demands and we do our research and we stay relevant. The other thing, Nick, that you said, which struck me, was that when you came in as chair, you start, you instituted this, you institutionalized this idea that people come in to work with other people. And the way you describe space sciences, you said it can't be this or that or the other. It's got to be all of them coming together. And I think this is one of the wonderful things about the college is that there are so many disciplines here and people find each other and when they find each other, they find uh, a new kind of problem to solve. And we also reach across to our fellow faculty in engineering and business. If you remember what Don Blakely said, he, he talked about the need for entrepreneurs in the, in the work that he's doing um, and in, and in uh, health professions and so on. So we are a college which has the fundamentals. Uh, we also have the ability to translate our research into applied uh, research, and we are constantly looking for partnerships. So, Courtney, I hope that that helped you a little bit in understanding where we were and where we are now. I think you're muted, Courtney. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much. This has been really fun to listen to the different departments and the faculty that have joined us and really appreciate you all taking the time. And we've had several alumni uh, watching. And um, one of the things that I heard just listening to everybody talk, I knew that we had a lot of collaboration throughout the university, but I think it's so exciting because that's something that we stress here at Wichita State University is to collaborate amongst uh, different departments and different colleges. And just to hear 
um, faculty members talk about how they are collaborating and working together across the university. It's really exciting. But we do have a question coming from uh, Lynette Murphy, and she's an alumna with a master's degree from the Elliott School. Um, but she'd like to know what Dean Hippesley thinks about the role of graduate education in the liberal arts. Yes, the role of graduate education, well, we have um, quite a few master's programs, uh, Lynette, and I know, I think you're an alum of the Elliott School. Uh, we have mm -hmm. master, a master's program in the Elliott School. We also have several PhD programs. Um, so we take graduate stu studies extremely seriously. It's a wonderful thing to have an undergraduate degree at Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences with its breadth and its general education emphasis. But to take it to the next step forward and to specialize and become an expert, this is a home for students as well. Excellent. So one of the questions that came in prior to the actual live event was just how the college has adapted during this time of coronavirus and some of the challenges that you face within your departments. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how it's affected your not only your faculty and staff, but your students and how you're interacting and continuing to to be able to engage with your students? Sure. Um, you know, we have, uh, as I said, 200 faculty, most of whom teach. So back in March, when suddenly we were told you need to now stop and change things so that you can teach online, many of them had never taught online. Um, many of them do their best teaching by not teaching online. Um, and that was a great, a harsh reality for them. And they had two weeks to do it. Uh, we held a town hall. Uh, part of the town hall was just a kind of reassuring one another, uh, <laughs> trying to give as much confidence to one another as possible. And in those two weeks, uh, the faculty went away and they changed the rest of, the, of their curriculum so that they can teach it, they could teach it remotely. Um, then over the summer, we had another town hall saying, okay, now we just provide for the fact that you will have to teach this remotely. Um, we have a wonderful uh, unit, the MRC, uh, who uh, created all the resources that we needed for faculty to use. And the faculty spent their summer many long hours changing their traditional courses that they may have been teaching for a number of years into something that could be taught remotely. Um, and, I, and I would say that they have done a magnificent job of that. Uh, one I will tell you about specifically because it's a story I love. Um, this is a geologist, Will Parcell, who um, must have been very sad that he couldn't run his traditional field camp. So what did he do? He recreated his field camp on <laughs> Minecraft. And there's a lovely video of a student navigating Minecraft and uh, and doing the same learning outcomes as she would have done otherwise. That's fantastic. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in and we're getting close to our time together. I really appreciate all of you joining us and thank you so much, Dean Hippesley. We really appreciate learning more about the college and appreciate you being part of the Homecoming 2020 event. Thank you so much, Courtney. And for everybody out there, your home is as strong as ever and your home has a great future. Thank you for joining us.